Welcome to the Bear Marriage Podcast. I'm Sheila Ray Gregg. We're from to love, honor, and vacuum.com. And every week on the Bear Marriage Podcast, we like to strip away all the stuff that we hear about marriage that actually doesn't help and isn't necessarily biblical and fill it instead with Jesus centered thoughts and advice. And so without further ado, we are going to start this podcast with a great interview that I recorded a couple of weeks ago. Well, I am so thrilled to welcome onto our podcast, Megan Chance, who is the author of the just released book, Women Rising, Learning to Listen, Reclaiming Our Voice. So Megan, thank you for being here. Thank you for having me. I'm so excited to be here. So much of what you share in your book is something which I am which just touches my heart and which I am so passionate about, which is fighting sex trafficking. Mm -hmm. I mean, whenever I even think about sex trafficking, it's like I, my mind, I just can't handle it. It's so Mm -hmm. terrible. And I can't believe that you spent time on the mission field in this area. I don't know Mm -hmm. if I emotionally could have handled that. So I'm wondering if you can just fill us in on some of your background and then we'll get to some of the really interesting things you're writing about. Absolutely. Yeah. So I grew up in the conservative evangelical church and um, wanted to like serve God the best way I knew how. And as a woman, I had some limited options there. So I chose to be a missionary. And when I was a missionary, I had the opportunity to work with women who had been sex trafficked. So I worked with women ranging. Well, so I also worked with women who had survived female genital mutilation and women who are widows, but primarily I worked with women who had been sex trafficked primarily in Southeast Asia. And so the bulk of my time is spent in both Thailand and the Philippines. The main organization I partnered with was an organization called Wipe Every Tear. And what they did is they took girls from the sex trade and put them all the way through college. So gave them an opportunity to really choose a life that they wanted to live and were passionate about and weren't being forced to sell their bodies. And so, um, yeah, I worked with trafficked women for about five years. Oh, that's amazing. And I will put a link to wipe every tear in yeah. the podcast description. If you want to look at that, um, to think about your own giving people. Um, I know I, I have worked in Kenya with some sex trafficked mm-hmm. women and we support some places in Cambodia too. So this is, it's just such a huge issue and it's it is. the most heartbreaking thing I can imagine. And so that must've taken quite the emotional toll being it did. there. Mm-hmm. But of course, you know, just witnessing like I, witnessing and living is like two different things. And so what they went through was just terrible. And so I heard story after story of how they ended up there and how they were trafficked. And um, like I said, it it, it can range in how they enter. Like the United States is different than say Southeast Asia to India. There's all different um, factors that lead them there, but all of them have, it boils down to a lack of choice and a lack of options for survival. Um, and so that makes them vulnerable to traffickers. Yeah. And this is something people, we really need to do our part to fight this. Mm -hmm. Like we really do. This Mm -hmm. is, this is probably the biggest human rights crisis in the world. So Mm -hmm. any way that we can put our money where our mouth is and, and support fighting sex trafficking is so important. So I just want to say that, but Megan, while you were out there, and this is really Mm -hmm. what your book is about. And I love Mm -hmm. this, what really affected you was as you were talking to the Johns who used the girls, as you were Mm -hmm. talking to the girls, you heard parroted back so many of the same teachings that we hear in evangelical circles. So can you elaborate on that for me? Absolutely. Yeah. So, I mean, I I kind of talked about already how I was a missionary and um, for about five years. And so I worked with an organization called Adventures and Missions. And the first two years I was on the field full time. And then the next three years I worked in their marketing department and led a course on anti-trafficking and then would also return and lead trips um, pretty regularly to the Philippines specifically. And so it was on one of those trips that I was in a bar. And so to describe the way it works in the Philippines or this particular area in Angeles City is women are on stage in underwear and there's um there's kind of like these seats around them there's like really loud music it's like dingy barely lit and these women on stage are like you can tell they're trying to like cover parts of their body that they're really uncomfortable with Mm. the situation that they're in and what happens is these men primarily foreigners primarily men from the united states or canada or australia are watching these women and when they want one of them they get a waitress and the waitress like shines a a laser light on them. And then that's their 
theirs for the night. And so what we did is we went in, watched also from the stage and just like pray God, like who, who should we speak to and would paint, um, you know, get a waitress's attentions to also point a laser at them. So once they get off the stage, you kind of sit with them in the bar and you have uh, the option to pay a bar fine, quote unquote bar fine, which is actually buying them for the night. And mm -hmm. so one night we were there, there's this woman on stage and we felt like we should talk to her. And she came and talked to us and she was telling me about how she ended up there, that she was in an abusive relationship with her boyfriend. She was showing me where she had like cigarette marks on her body where she was burned and told us that she had no other way to provide for her child and that her boyfriend kind of wanted her to do this work. And so we were talking, have a, having a conversation and she seemed really interested in, in Wipe Every Tear and what they had to offer. Um, but as I was speaking to her, these six drunk men came up and wanted to buy her. And um, I asked her, I was like, do you want to go with them? And she said, no. And so she said no to them. And I said no. And we were both saying no, but they weren't taking no for an answer. And they started to try and grab her and like physically take her. And at this point, I didn't know what to do. And so I had a teammate run up to me and she said, Megan, why don't you just buy her first? And so I paid her bar fine um, first. And um, we thought that, you know, she would be able to go home and spend time with her child. Unfortunately, these men still tried to take her. And so we ended up getting in a fight. Me and my teammate ended up getting in a fight with the bar managers arguing, which was such a terrible thing to argue about like she's our property we bought her first which is just a ludicrous argument we ended up winning the argument but unfortunately in this process the men just got more and more and more angry and so eventually won the argument and our and our friend was able to go home but what happened is these men just in their anger just grabbed another woman off the stage and I remember her looking back at us with just terror in her eyes and by this point, I knew how dangerous the sex trade was because I had someone that we had worked with previous. She was murdered by a client. And so I just remember collapsing on the street, feeling like I had made the situation worse because what I saw is that these men were not just drunk, but now they were angry and drunk. And I knew the kind of violence that is more likely that comes with mm -hmm. anger. And just the way that she was so quickly replaced, like we were able to help one woman for the night and hopefully, you know, longer than that, if she's interested in joining Wipe Every Tear and joining their safe houses. But at the same time, she was so quickly replaced. And I just remember right. feeling like, what am I even doing here? Are we helping? Is this making anything better? How do we fight the demand? Why is this happening? Why are there so many men that are mm -hmm. willing to travel across the world to buy women. Mm -hmm. And it was the next night that I actually got my, my question answered really quickly. It wasn't my first experience with the Johns, but this interaction I had really, I think, solidified some things and in, in my understanding of the sex trade. And so the next night we were in the bars again. And as we were leaving, these American guys called us over and they're like, hey, why are you here? And we told him, I told them there was two of them. One was like a young, like buff army guy. And one was like an older man, probably in his sixties. And he had this, you know, young girl, like under his shoulder, possessively, like he was possessively holding her. And um, we told him we're here to, you know, these, to offer these girls a college education if they're interested and to provide for their dependents. And we're telling him all these things. So oh, he's like, oh yeah, that's great. And we asked him, why are you here? And he said, because women here are raised right they know how to respect men and I like deserve respect. And he said this in the middle of a tirade oh. about how women in the West were not respectful towards men and he deserved respect and he was entitled to respect. And so he was going to get it any way he could. And in this case, he thought that he could get the respect that he was entitled to and deserved by traveling across the world uh, to buy it from a trafficked woman. And wow. yeah. <laughs> And I, like, as he was talking to me, it sounded really familiar, but I couldn't place my finger on it first. And then it just- All of our listeners will know where you'd heard that from. <laughs> yes. 
I'm like, this sounds like teachings I had from my evangelical preachers growing up, my evangelical mm-hmm. pastors who told me that men deserve and are entitled to respect without conditions. If they don't get it, then like they'll, they'll find a way to get it. And women should be submissive and quiet and, and subservient. And um, it was just like, oh my goodness. It was this huge realization. Like, wow, I, I didn't realize that the, the ideas we have about men needing respect and women being submissive were actually, I mean, I always resisted them just because they, there was something that sat wrong with it in my spirit, but like to actually mm-hmm. see the fruit of it, that these kind of teachings, this kind of ideology is driving men to go halfway around the world to buy trafficked women because he wanted and was entitled to respect. And I started thinking about my past interactions with Johns. And this was a common refrain that I heard is like, I'm here to get respect. There was a lot of um, like bravado trying to prove their masculinity and made me think about like all these gender scripts we have, like men are supposed to be in control. They're supposed to be dominant. They need respect. They need to, you know, be financially what's the word powerful financially in control Mm -hmm. and Mm -hmm. I was like oh my goodness um I have been complicit in these teachings I've been complicit in this ideology and I'm seeing that for the last five years I've been working with these women and this is a huge root of what's driving the oppression of women I mean this is literally why the men are telling me they're coming and so I I quit my job actually. And I was like, I need to get the church's attention and talk about these um, gender roles and power differentials. And so that's what led me to write my book, Women Rising, uh, Reclaiming Our Voice, um, or yeah, learning to listen, reclaiming our voice. And the whole idea of like learning to listen to these women's stories, learning to listen to what they say is why they ended up there. And then using those stories to understand and address the systemic ideology we have that is creating these power differentials in the first place. You know, it's interesting. Um, and I know that in your book, you talk about Emerson Egrich and love and respect, but it's, yeah. it's interesting how the John's definition of how he deserved respect mm-hmm. meant that she could not receive it. Mm-hmm. Like in order for him to feel respected, he had to be able to completely disrespect her. Yes. And that seems to be something which is so common, like in, in love and respect, I know that I I don't mean to trivialize this and, and, Mm -hmm. but, but I I think this is the point that you're making as well Mm -hmm. is that we see it throughout, but there's Mm -hmm. a stupid incident he talks about with wet towels where he leaves Mm -hmm. wet towels on the bed and his wife was complaining about this and wanted him to stop. And then she went away for a week. And when she came home, she said, did you miss me? And he said that he and the boys really hadn't missed her because they hadn't been nagged in a week. And so she learned that the the moral of the story was she stopped asking him to not leave wet towels on the bed. So the only way that he could feel respected was if she didn't make any demands on him at all. Right. Right. And so it's like the definition of respect that men are supposed to get means that women cannot ever speak up for their own needs. Yep. I mean, he actually says in his book that the husband deserves respect without conditions. So I I mean, it's this idea like this woman, if you think about like the drivers of the sex trade, and you know, I've listened to enough stories. um, The story I heard again, again, specifically in the Philippines was like, even with like climate change happening. So there's whole provinces that are being wiped out by these typhoons. And they have, you know, there's families that have, you know, many kids and they're like, how do we survive? And they'll send their oldest children to the city and they're like, find a, find a ways to support us. And there's like 10 mouths to feed. And this is how they yeah. end up getting trafficked is because they don't have, um, you know, a traditional education. They're not able to find a job. And so traffickers are looking out for that. And so um, they'll be like, oh, hey, come work at this restaurant. And they don't know the full extent of what that means. Like you're going to be serving foreigners. It's this bar or whatever. And, um, you know, I had one woman tell me that like it was, her she thought she was just working in a restaurant and eventually they would um, get her drunk and drug her and rape her and that's how she like kind of became that's how they like kind of broke her spirit so Mm -hmm. that she would I guess perform um the way and so when we're talking about this idea that this man came to get the respect these are women that have no other options these are women that don't have they don't have any resources available to get the help that they need and 
he like they're not in any position to like ask anything or demand anything of the Johns and so they're and and there's story after story after story that we hear of violence that these women are surviving from the Johns or um these outrageous acts that they see in porn that they're like oh this is so uh, degrading I wouldn't do it with my my girlfriend or my my wife but I will go and mm -hmm. get it done here because these women don't matter and they don't have a choice and right. so I think that's something we really need to focus on. Like, but he defined all of this as, as respect. His definition yeah. of respect was a woman that had no choice but to meet every one of his needs and not speak up for her own needs because she couldn't. Yeah, I think it's really important that we do evaluate what, it, what are these. And more than that, there's, so there's many studies that are coming out which I'm sure you're familiar with that talk about sexual assault and sexual abuse and what is the root of that. And it's actually power differential. Yes. So there's, yeah, it's not about sex. It's, it's about not power. about sex. Yep. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's about power. And so there's this incredible um, psychoanalyst, her name is Lynn Yonak. And she actually, if you guys Google it, there's an incredible article about this on psychology today, but it talks about how, wait, 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 say, say her name again. Lynn Yonak. Okay, so how do you spell the last bit, the last name? Y-O-N-A-C-K. Okay, I will put the link in the podcast description yeah. and podcast notes. Awesome, okay. Okay, yeah. so she writes this incredible article about how sexual assault and sexual abuse is actually about power. And so when we think about this, when we hear stories of, you know, say Ravi Zacharias or, or maybe even a college professor sexually assaulting or raping or whatever his student we always see these power differentials in play it's it's a mm -hmm. pastor and it's a congregant or it's an, it's an adult and it's a child or it's a you know someone who has power over someone mm -hmm. who doesn't have power and there's a reason for that that's because sexual assault is not about sexual feelings it's about domination and control and exerting that and in um, a sexual way. And it can often be eroticized, like what we see in porn, this whole domination right. of women. And so that often, I mean, it goes hand in hand. So when we're, when we're talking about what's driving sexual assault, what's driving sexual abuse, and beyond that, what's driving the sex trade, it's power differentials. It's saying men deserve an entitled and own power and women are there to, I guess, meet his needs and, and make him feel like he's powerful. And, and it, it was, it was shocking to me to be like, actually, that's the kind of things I was told was biblical growing up in the church. And we mm -hmm. really need to confront these ideas. And so, I mean, again, that's why I wrote the book is because I want us to evaluate mm -hmm. and address our ideas of these, these gender roles and these ideas that men are supposed to be powerful and strong and women are supposed to be submissive to that. Right. And even like when we talk about rape culture and a lot of people mm -hmm. hate that term and they don't really know what it means. So, mm -hmm. so why don't you tell us what you think rape culture means? I think rape culture is a society that um, unfortunately that we live in where, so for example, I'm going to get throw out some statistics to, to illustrate the point. So one in three women in the United States is the survivor of sexual assault or domestic violence. So one in three, that's quite high. If you think about it, you count out three, think of three women that you know in your head, one in three of them is a survivor, okay? And then on top of that, if you look at more statistics, between one and five and between one and six is the survivor of rape or attempted rape in the United States. Right. Okay, so now we know that this is a prevalent problem. This is super prevalent. Like you're more likely to be a survivor of sexual assault than, I mean, my goodness, so many other things, right? Like, yeah. I, I mean, like one in three chance, that's, a fr that's very high. And so um, in addition to that, if we also look at the way we treat our justice system in terms of men that are raped, of course, these are all United States statistics. So I know you're mm -hmm. from Canada. So most of my listeners are American though. Okay. So they're, all, <laughs> okay. they're all very patient with me. So that's <laughs> <Yeah>. great. <laughs> um, but in the United States, only five in one thousand rapists face jail time. Five in one thousand. Okay. So here's right. Those are just some statistics that we know that are from RAIN, um, R-A-I-N-N.org, which is a site for domestic violence and it gives you statistics like that. So we're asking this question, okay, clearly it's prevalent. The question is why? Mm -hmm. Why does this keep happening? Why is it so prevalent? And oftentimes we don't even ask the question, how many men rape? 
And so right. I was actually talking to a domestic violence advocate and educator. She is actually from the UK, so it might be different, but they did a study and it's estimated between 10 and 20% of men are abusers. This is in the UK and I'm just quoting her. So I, I don't know mm-hmm. exactly where she got that information, but it's probably on my podcast. But um, all of that to say, we need to ask the question, why is this happening? What what societally are we teaching that this is such a prevalent problem? And I think, yeah, growing- because I think, I think what a lot of Christians will say, well, it's just sin. Yes. Well, I wanted to address that. Yeah. Um, like it's just sin, but right. no, it's like, there's other influences right. that, that, Absolutely. That, that, that push sin in a certain direction. <laughs> right. So I think in the, in the evangelical church, we're kind of raised with this idea that everything is individualistic. So we ask, why did Ravi Zacharias do what he did. Oh, well, he was individually stumbling or a sin. Okay. But what about this guy who hurt this woman? And, but we ask this question over and over again, what about this guy? What about this guy? What about this guy? Oh, it's just an individual sin. But when we're asking that question, probably, you know, at least on a bi-weekly, a monthly basis, when, when there's some story in the news about a Mm -hmm. pastor who's abused his power, or maybe not a pastor, but, you know, maybe like Harvey Weinstein, if this is happening again and again, and again, we have to see the system that there's something that we're teaching our boys and our men and our our women that are contributing to this problem. And so if we, let's go back to like my childhood, I was raised with, you know, even outside the church, um, don't be a sissy, don't be a girl. Like being a girl was a bad thing. Like it was used as an insult. And today it's still used as an insult. Don't run like a girl. Don't throw Mm -hmm. like a girl. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And even if you think about today, like in an adult language, don't be a P word. Mm -hmm. that is also Mm -hmm. misogynistic and it's this idea that women are less and so we see this on a cultural basis obviously but we also need to look at it within our churches what message are young boys getting when they're told that women are there to respect them to meet their needs and be sexually available to them it's it's teaching an entitlement of women's bodies it's not teaching them about consent which is a really important conversation that we need to have and mm-hmm. it's, 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 it's this idea that subtly teaching the idea that men are better. They're more equipped yeah. to lead. They're more t- equipped to teach. They're more equipped. They're more spiritual. And Which is but- ironic because we're saying that, that men are more equipped to teach and lead at the same time as we're saying that all men lust, it's every man's battle. And yes. so it's women's role to stop men from lusting. Yep. I mean, in conservative Christian culture, it kind of seems like men are supposed to be in charge of everything except their sexual urges. Yes. We're really just going <laughs> to boil it down here. Men are supposed to be in charge of everything, but if they act on, you know, a bad sexual urge, well, she tempted me. She, she needs mm-hmm. to cover up. And so if we're, like, I was raised with this idea of purity culture, which I'm sure is something you talk about here, but I was raised to believe that my body was a stumbling block. That as a woman, I was a temptation that I would cause men to lust and that I needed mm-hmm. to be covered up at all times, lest someone lust after me and doing bad things to me. And in fact, I was reprimanded when I was 13 for wearing a shirt that just showed like the small sliver of my stomach when I raised my hands and my pastor pulled me aside and told me I was being shameful and that that would make men do bad things. Okay. Hold on a second. I want to, I want to sit there for a minute because I know there's a lot of women listening who've had similar stories. I did a post a while ago on Mm -hmm. what were you wearing when you were first, you know, sexually harassed at church, like Mm -hmm. a pastor coming up to a 13 year old girl, Mm -hmm. that's super shaming and intimidating. Right. Absolutely. Cause I didn't have any power in the situation and I'm, and I was not trying to be any, I'm 13. Like I haven't even kissed anyone. Like I don't even know about sex hardly, especially growing up in the church. I didn't know anything about sex. Yeah. And so what that mess that communicated to me is like, my body is dangerous. My body will make men yes. do bad things. And unfortunately a week later, I was sexually assaulted by a stranger who grabbed oh, my breast goodness. and I didn't tell anyone for over a decade because I connected, oh, this was somehow my fault. This was something that I did wrong. And it went along with all of the teachings. Like I was told, you know, you go to the swimming pool, I have to be fully colored, covered in clothes where young boys could wear whatever they want. Or um, another thing that I was told was don't show it if it's not on the market. This idea that my body is number one, a market. And number two, that you're entitled to touch whatever you see, like whatever skin is showing you're entitled. That's 
that's not okay. And so Mm -hmm. if we're looking at these teachings again and again and again, the impetus is on the girl or the woman to control a man's thoughts, to control his sexual desire. And the Mm -hmm. responsibility is not put on the man who is responsible for this action. And Mm so I like not only did that keep me as a survivor of sexual assault silent for over a decade because I held so much shame at the age of 13 that I must have caused this man to do this to me. Not only was it that shame and that silence, but it was also like, okay, well, I need to be super careful around men because they can't control themselves. They're just going to assault me if I, if I show any kind of my womanhood. And so if we're going to boil like down the fruit, let's, let's look at the shootings that happened in Atlanta Mm -hmm. um, a couple of weeks ago. This was a young man raised in purity culture in the Baptist church. And I just showed you, told you all about the teachings. And he said that he murdered people to eliminate Eliminate the temptation. temptation. How many times had I been told I was a temptation that Mm -hmm. I was going to cause men to do do bad things. And so instead of taking responsibility for Mm -hmm. his own feelings or his own actions, he chose to blame it on women. And so when we're talking about this concept of rape culture, I think that's part of rape culture, this idea that it's women's responsibility, that it's women's jobs. You know, one of the things that that we um, picked up on in our recent book, um, the Great Sex Rescue was something Shanti Feldon wrote in her book for young women only. And I've dissected this survey question mm-hmm. before and I've mentioned it many times, but I want to keep coming back to it because it's so toxic. We need to get this straight. But she had this one conclusion, which I don't believe was warranted given her survey question. But what she said is that 82% of teenage boys feel little ability and little responsibility to stop in a makeout situation. So if you don't want to go all the way, it's better to not even start. Mm. Like that's rape culture right there. If you want a good definition of rape culture, that's rape culture. Telling teenage girls that that 82% of boys feel little ability or little responsibility to stop. And that was my, that was my experience growing up. Like if I had a boyfriend and we were kissing, I was always the one that had to stop. They would always push the boundaries. Yeah. Um, Which isn't fair. And also because you can be so easily overpowered. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's, it's, I mean, it is rape. It's rape culture. It's this idea that women are responsible. And we see, so we even yeah. see this in larger society. So for example, let's talk about um, Brock Turner. He was right. caught by witnesses raping mm-hmm. a woman. He's the Stanford Many people swim- We call him the Stanford swimmer, which is terrible because we should really call him the Stanford rapist, right? Right. But- he right, was on the yeah. swim team, the famous guy on the swim team at Stanford, right. yeah. Mm-hmm. Who was caught raping, like there are witnesses. And so Chanel mm-hmm. Miller is the survivor of the rape and she wrote an incredible book. But what she really points out is this idea that she was still being said she was responsible when she was unconscious. Yes. Being raped. And so she still had the hardest time ever even winning her case. And the only reason she won is because there were so many witnesses. And even though she won, like this is best case scenario, how often are, you know, rapes are generally yeah. not in public. Hers was. And so she was able to prove it. But even mm-hmm. with all this proof and people witnessing it, he only got sentenced to six months in prison. And right. then on top of that, he only served three months of that because of his good behavior. Don't tell me that we're valuing yeah. women in our justice system when we let rapists off with, with a slap on the wrist. I mean, I just read an article. Uh, I mean, it really stood out to me. So I'm from Colorado. And about a year ago, there was a police officer who raped a woman in his custody. She was handcuffed. And he got three months. And um, I, I mean, it's just, it's just astonishing to me, like the abuse of power there. But I mean, we need to look at our justice system. We need to ask, what are we teaching? Why do, if, if it's true that young boys feel like they can't stop, why? What are you teaching them? Exactly. Because you always yeah. have an ability to stop. Absolutely. And why aren't, we, why aren't we telling boys that, that you have an ability to stop and you need to use it. And I think, you know, when I, when I think about the church as well and how the church is complicit in this, like mm-hmm. how many times is a pastor or is someone high up in Christian circles been been caught mm-hmm. abusing power, sexually abusing someone, and then mm-hmm. we're all just supposed to forgive them and restore them? Right. Absolutely. I mean, let's talk about Andy Stanley. He. You mean um, Andy Savage? Andy or, Savage. Yeah. I mean, sorry, Andy Savage. Sorry, not Andy Stanley. Did not yes. mean to mess that up. <laughs> um, he, <laughs> 
you know, there was a young girl that in his youth group who's underage and he basically mm -hmm. coerced her, forced her into giving him um, a blow job and then like pushed her out of the car or like he went out of the car and like was crying out for God's forgiveness. It came forward to the church. The church just covered it up. And so 20 years later, he comes after her prompting and says, I did this. I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. And the church applauded him instead of saying, well, maybe you shouldn't be in a position to do this yeah. to more young girls. And so I think there's just story after story after story where the, the, the men aren't held responsible because they've been raised to believe they aren't responsible, right? This mm -hmm. boy, That statistic, like you just gave 80% of boys are raised to believe that they can't stop. Of course they can. They're human beings yeah. made in yeah. the image of God. Of course they have self-control. That's a fruit of the spirit. Oh my goodness. Yes. yes, exactly. So why are we telling young boys that they don't have self-control? And and why are we also, I think hand in hand with that, why are we saying that women are supposed to be in control and like have control over another person's abilities or, or choice to say no yes. like we can't control another person's thoughts we can't control another person's actions that's solely on the person who committed the offense mm -hmm. and I think you know when, when you look at all of these different messaging that all men lust that they can't mm -hmm. help it boys have little ability to stop that what boys mm -hmm. really need is to be given unconditional respect it really right. does it really does lead to some very strange gender dynamics. And right. I, I read a quote from your book and I'm going to get this wrong, but basically it's like, um, the way that the way that the church talks about gender is really the same way that predators and sex traffickers mm -hmm. talk about gender. Yes, it is. I mean, that was my experience. I saw a John who talked just like the, you know, Emerson yeah. Yeah. and it's sad to me that it's like the same. I mean, that was my big realization is like the same ideologies, gender theology we have in the church is what's driving predators. Like we need mm -hmm. to address this. Why are we teaching men's domination in the church when that's when men are choosing to rape or harm women? Mm -hmm. And so how, because, because the Bible doesn't do that. Right. Like the Bible. So, so when you look at the Bible, do you see the same messages about domination? Cause there's absolutely, I, mean, I think not. what I get a lot of is, well, yeah, but the Bible's full of rape. It's like, yes, but it's, it's, it's not presented as a good thing. <laughs> well, I think so. I think, uh, I think it's Carolyn Custis James, who she actually wrote the forward for my book, but she said, people look at the Bible as prescriptive all the time instead of descriptive. And so what the Bible is doing is describing an extremely misogynistic patriarchal culture. I mean, let's talk about Abraham. He gave his wife as a sex slave to Pharaoh. Okay. But yes. we don't talk about this. This is not the way we're not trying like this. We know yes. this is not okay. Like we know and it's like not okay. Esther, Esther spent a yeah. night with the king. What do you think she was doing? It's not a right. love story. It's not, it's a, not love a love story. story. Yeah. And so, <laughs> yeah. And, and, and like more than that, like, I want to focus on the women. So women we're in an extremely patriarchal culture when women are mentioned, like we should really take notice. Like why is a woman getting mentioned and this patriarchal uh, culture. And so we look at, for example, Esther, what did she do? She disobeyed her husband. She broke yeah. with gender norms. Um, same story with Ruth, same story with Mary Magdalene. One of my favorite stories mm -hmm. in the Bible is Mary and Martha. And so if you're familiar, I'm sure everyone knows this story. Martha is preparing, she's functioning in her gender role. She's preparing things for the home. And Mary is breaking all of the rules, sitting at the feet of Jesus in, a, in the company of men, gasp, everything she's not supposed to be doing. And so Martha is like, hey, Jesus, get Mary yeah. to help me um, clean and, and perform her duties as a woman. And what mm -hmm. Jesus says in response is, Mary has chosen what is better and it will not be taken from her. And in that one sentence to me, I feel like Jesus is just saying N down with the gender roles, like women should be allowed to sit at the feet of Jesus and learn and be in the company of men. And they don't have to be in the home. They can be behaving, you know, quote unquote, behaving as a man would. And so for mm -hmm. me, I don't see that at all in the Bible. I know people take um, verses specifically, you know, Ephesians five, and they take it out of context. And, and, and let's talk specifically about Ephesians five, that says wives submit to your husband. The beginning of the chapter says, submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. So everyone is supposed mm -hmm. to be submitting to one another. That's how it starts, you know? Yeah. And I just yeah. feel like we've just twisted it and, and, and missed the point. I, I don't know how people can read the Bible and be like, oh, the end. Okay. 
Jesus wants submissive housewives and dominant husbands. Like, wait, how did you get mm. that from what you just read? Like, this was a man who continually challenged power structures. He yeah. stood up to, you know, Pharisees, the religious elite saying, you are making this all about rules and I want you to love one another. And, and he talks to the Pharisees and say, you give a 10th of your spices, dill and cumin, but you've neglected justice and mercy. And this is more important. And so yeah. for me, what I see is, 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 is Jesus himself came to continually give up his power. They expected him to come as a king and dominate like they have always seen, but what he chose to do again and again and again was serve to give up his power to wash people's yes. feet but yet in the church we're trying to to put this dominance and control into our marriages that that doesn't make sense to me no that's great and so in your book as as we just wrap mm -hmm. up I, I just love how you know you, you show how you took this this instance <laughs> where you were really in some of the darkest parts of the world mm -hmm. And you saw the North American church there, which you never yep. expected to see. Mm -mm. And it's like, no, we gotta, we gotta wash all of this away yep. and we have to get back to Jesus, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, and what does Jesus want for us? And especially us as women. And so I know there's a lot of our listeners who have been going through quite the faith journey <laughs> as I have been, and you all <laughs> been going through it with me on this podcast for the last few years you know, of just trying to rediscover Jesus and trying to mm -hmm. rediscover, well, really, I think your subtitle says it all, you know, like learning to listen and reclaiming our voices mm -hmm. that Jesus does care and he does listen and mm -hmm. he does see, I think that's beautiful. I will put the links to, um, where you can support, um, anti-sex trafficking organizations. Cause those are so important. I appreciate that. Of course, where we can get women rising. I'm so excited that you came on just, just as you've just yeah. released it. That's so, that's so cool. Yeah. And where else can people find you, Megan? Um, they can just find me on Instagram or my website, um, Megan Chance. It's, it's a unique name. I'm the only one. So <laughs> yeah. I know I'm, there's not a lot of Sheila Gregoire's either. That can be very useful sometimes, yes. <laughs> so, but thank you. And you know, um, sometimes this stuff looks really dark, but there's so much hope mm -hmm. there. And I'm just so excited. There's so many more people seeing this and talking about it and raising awareness because we can do better. I think God is calling the church to so much more Absolutely. and it's so neat to have more voices there. So thank you mm -hmm. so much for being here, Megan. Yeah. Thank you for having me. <laughs> That was amazing. I, you know, I read, I finished her book since, re since recording that interview, I did finish her book and it was, it was really sad in parts, but it was so neat to see her finding her voice. And I think this is such an important topic. So I'm glad Megan wrote that. And I have brought my daughter, Rebecca onto the podcast now. Hi. And we have some new research to share with you today. Yes, we do. Uh, it's not that new. No. But we haven't talked about it before. So it's new to us. Yes. So new to us research segment of the week. Yes. I found this one really, really interesting. So what they did was they surveyed students from Bethel Seminary. Yep. And what they did is they looked at both what theological beliefs they agreed with Mm -hmm. what theological stances and also how much they strongly agreed or disagreed with um, domestic violence myths yes because what we know from other studies is, is that the belief in domestic violence myths is highly correlated with domestic, domestic violence. violence but it's also <laughs> highly correlated with um you know your willingness to cover up abuse yes. your willingness to believe the perpetrator over the victim you downplay when the abuse how bad the abuse was like it's mm -hmm. just you're not a safe person for um domestic abuse victims if you believe domestic abuse myths right and so what they were looking at is are there certain theological beliefs that are correlated with domestic violence myths? yeah so they specifically looked at calvinism Yep. So whether or not people believed at Calvinist theology mm -hmm. and whether or not they believed domestic violence myths. And here's what they found. The researchers found that Calvinist beliefs were positively associated with domestic violence myth acceptance. In other words, seminary students who agreed with statements like Christ's redeeming work was intended to save the elect only and God eternally perseveres in his faithfulness with those whom he has chosen were more likely to also agree with statements like a lot of domestic violence occurs because women keep on arguing about things with their partner and many women have an unconscious wish to be dominated by their partners. 
Now, mm -hmm. it's important to say what the researchers say as well, is this is not saying that if you are Calvinist, you also believe these things. Right. Right? But Calvinism tends to be highly correlated with strong gender hierarchy beliefs. Yeah. Not always the case. My husband and I are kind of attending an egalitarian Presbyterian church right now that's yeah. very Calvinist because yeah. it's Presbyterian, <laughs> but they're also very non-hierarchical. So here's where it gets tricky for researchers, right? We look at Christians as a whole, or religious folk as a whole, and we have better marriages, we tend to have better yes. sex lives, happiness kind of goes up. In general, life just gets better if you believe in Jesus. Yeah, and we found this in our survey too, yeah. is that the more religious people tend to be happier. Yeah. But we also knew that there were certain subsets of that group that weren't. Yes, and that's what they're trying to figure out here is we can say, for instance, that the average person in North America has a higher standard of living than the average person in maybe like Chad. Right. Or something. Mm -hmm. But that does not mean that every single person in North America is richer or has a better standard of living than every single person in Chad. Right. Right? And that's what we're trying to figure out. Christians as a whole may be doing better, but there are subgroups that seem to be not doing great. Mm -hmm. Look at the toxic sex abuse scandals in the SBC. Mm -hmm. Look at um, how domestic violence is handled in a lot of church settings. Right. You know, we know that we're failing in some areas and we're trying to figure out why as a research you know, from, yeah. from the research angle. And it does seem to be that there are some kinds of yeah. belief systems that simply make it more likely to also believe that, well, if women, if the if a husband hits his wife, she was probably did something to ask yeah. for. And they also measured complementarian beliefs as well, like yep. hierarchy and marriage and things like that, which were also highly correlated with domestic yeah. violence. So in yes. essence, it, it seems to me from reading this, that people who are highly Calvinistic and also highly believe in gender hierarchies tend to not be safe mm -hmm. for domestic abuse beliefs. Yeah. And, and so I think what we're, what we're trying to say is like, if you are Calvinist, we are not saying that you abuse no. your wife or that you're an abuse victim. Yeah. <laughs> but we are saying that it very well could be that in your community, this is a problem. Yeah. Like if you're the safe person in your church, that's awesome. But you may actually want to really consider if the other person in your church if the other people in your church are safe. Because mm -hmm. statistically speaking, they are unlike they are less likely to be than the Episcopalian church down the road. Yes. And maybe we need to start thinking about whether or not our beliefs actually are the proper interpretation, which is which again yep. is what Megan was saying in her book. There were some articles coming out around the church two time and around the time this day was published that it was saying actually complementarianism protects women. Mm -hmm. Like it, pe women are better off under complementarianism. And we would like to call that our false teaching of the week. Yeah, it really <laughs> is because women are better off when their rights, their opinions, their needs, and their personhood are all mm -hmm. elevated to the same level as the other people in the community. Yeah, which again, we're not saying that if you're complementarian that you don't support women or that you don't value women, but we are saying that complementarianism is more highly correlated with these yeah. negative things. It and just so is. So if you fall in that camp or if your church falls in that camp, have your eyes extra wide open. We mm -hmm. all need to have our eyes open, mm -hmm. but you need to, in essence, not give people the benefit of the doubt. Mm -hmm. And that sounds really harsh to say, yeah. but don't give them benefit of the doubt mm -hmm. because statistically speaking, they shouldn't have it. Yeah. And Megan did a great job in her book showing how those kinds of beliefs are also what fuels sex trafficking yeah. too. And so we just really need to be careful about yes. what we believe and are we really giving the true picture of what Jesus came for? Okay, so that was our new research segment. We have a reader question, mm -hmm. which is not exactly a reader question again. It's just a really cool letter that came in um, that I thought could, could generate some debate here. Okay, so this one's written by a guy. Awesome. And he says... Um, my question is about traditional marriage roles, i.e. women stay at home, raise kids, cook clean while the man is the primary breadwinner. It seems like the churches that we've attended have failed to come to terms with the fact that society has changed and that many families now require both spouses to work, which means that the household tasks need to be shared by both. For me personally, this has been a huge struggle. Not the tasks themselves, but basically having to silence all the teachings in my head about what a godly home looks like, with the wife making the home and greeting the husband with a clean house and dinner waiting and the best behaved children on the planet. Our household is definitely not traditional. Both my wife and I work and we both raise our kids together. My wife handles the brunt of the logistics and coordination and the household work is split about 70-30 with me handling the brunt of that. Mm -hmm. It's lonely. In church we were always the odd ones out because very few others could relate to us. None of the other husbands talked about doing dishes or cooking dinner five to six nights a week. The women didn't know how to interact with my wife because she isn't the stereotypical godly wife and so we're currently not attending church. Are there any resources or encouragement out there? 
Yeah. I have a theory. Okay. You want to hear my theory? Yes. I think that if we were to look at all of the people who are not currently attending church Mm -hmm. because of reasons like this, it would be larger than the group who is currently attending church. Yeah. Like they aren't attending (laughs) church because maybe like there's just a something doesn't fit with who they are. That's not a gospel Mm -hmm. issue. Right. And and I think Jesus did not die so that men don't do dishes and women do. Yes. Like this is not a gospel issue. No, it isn't. And yet, <laughs> and yet our church cultures often revolve around this idea, you know, that, that men are the primary breadwinners, women are home, and there's nothing wrong with being home. I stayed home with my kids. I'm currently, in essence, doing that. I mean, Connor right. and I both work from home, but he really is the primary provider, and I'm yes. the primary kind of child care and stuff, right. mainly because I'm the one who keeps getting pregnant and having to breastfeed kids. Yeah, so we are not arguing against traditional gender nope. roles in the least. But we do need to see that as not the only choice. And also, frankly, there's no reason that he should not be able to have other friends who can, like, talk about doing dishes or cooking dinner. Mm -hmm. Because everyone should do that. Everybody should do that, even if you work outside the home. So that's a problem. But I, I think that my challenge to pastors would be this. Start talking to the people who are leaving your church. Yeah, because what often happens is people leave the church and then they're just ghosted. Yeah, and find out why. Because it could be that you are creating a culture in your church which makes people not feel welcome because of their lifestyle, which has nothing to do with the gospel. Yeah, maybe it's just that, you know, he happened to marry a woman who is really career-oriented and has amazing gifts that God gave her, and Mm -hmm. he ends up doing, like he said, has more of the free time, so he makes all the dinners. Yeah, and I would also say, remember, pastors, that our church services are based on the needs from 500 years ago. Yeah, no kidding. When people didn't have access to scripture, when they didn't have access to teaching, and so the focus of the church service had to be teaching, because it was the only way anyone was going to learn. What COVID is showing us we all know is that we can listen to podcasts and we can listen to great teaching yep. online what people really need is community they really need people to talk to they really need friendships and so maybe we need to start thinking about how to make our our gatherings different we need to totally reimagine what the gathering looks like so that maybe it's not so oriented around a sermon but is instead oriented around even the eucharist i mean that's what they used to do in the early church i studied Mm -hmm. the early church in a whole course in university and there was an uh, definitely a a teaching aspect but the majority of it was a celebration eucharist where you had communion but then you also had a big kind of potluck meal with the whole community And so think about that. Now, for the guy, what I would say is chances are that there are gatherings in your community that maybe aren't in some of the bigger churches, but oh, yeah. they're full of people just like you. Oh, I yeah. know that in our church, in our community, there's some gatherings that are forming where they're more focused on the potluck idea and just building community. And so I would just encourage you to think outside the box. And, and also, it does sound like you're going to a very traditional sounding church. Yeah. And you use the words like traditional and typical and, yeah. and um, traditional churches are not the only churches yes you can check out other denominations that you may Mm -hmm. have never thought about before just you know explore find the people who love jesus where you really belong yeah yeah okay so now a little bit of encouragement yay Mm -hmm. i should this was one of the best encouragements we have ever gotten i will i i was determined not to be on social media all last weekend because it's been eating into me, which is why I didn't reply to comments on Facebook and Instagram. Probably some of you noticed that because I'm usually quite in the comments and I was not last weekend. And so things kind of got weird. But (laughs) um, I did check Twitter once. And when I did, there was this Twitter thread which totally made my weekend. And I put it in a post on Monday, but I want to read it to you. This is by a guy who is a licensed counselor. And he said this. Here's something that needs to be said about Christian self-help books. They need to be well-researched. For instance, Sheila Ray Gregoire's The Great Sex Rescue is stellar qualitative research that is also biblically informed. Books can be both. To be blunt, so much of Christian literature on topics like marriage, sex, abuse, mental health, manhood, recovery is just lazy. (laughs) Instead of doing the difficult work of researching an idea, many authors trust their experiences as absolute. This worked for me, so it will work for you. Or even worse, this worked for me and here is some scripture to support my thesis so it should work for you because it's God's way of doing so. Yes, exactly. This is not only lazy but potentially harmful and I'd say dishonoring to God and his church. Anecdotal does not equal true for the masses. Years ago, when I started working on a book on marriage, a mentor challenged me to make it as well-grounded in research as any non-Christian marriage book. At first, this seemed nearly impossible compared to the Gottman literature that I'm trained in. That's John Gottman's Marriage Institute. We've talked about that before on the podcast. It's great. 
but why not? Many of us have been conditioned to think research takes away from biblical truths. But again, that's just lazy. Mm -hmm. We ought to set an even higher bar for ourselves. Excellent research can display the excellency of Christ and we shouldn't be afraid of it. So as a licensed counselor, licensed marriage therapist, PhD student and professor, I want to publicly say thanks Sheila, Rebecca and Joanna for writing a book that took both scripture and research seriously. It's been a breath of fresh air. Yes. That was really awesome. I do want to say, he says we do really, really good qualitative Yeah, research. it was actually quantitative. It's both. Well, it's both. both. Qualitative and quantitative. I yes. do want to make sure that's put in there. Yes. So here you go. Great sex rescue. Yes. Yes. We are very proud of it. And I'm very happy that people are finding it. You know, it's funny how many pastors and counselors are talking about it. Yeah. That's what, what's really encouraging to us because it's been pastors and counselors who have pushed things like love and respect or sheet music or for women only in the past. Yeah. So if they change... And they start recommending yeah. the Great Sex Rescue yeah. or, you know, even Talking Back to Purity Culture by Rachel Joy Welcher, right? Like for yeah. people who are in kind of coming out of the harmful things that have been pushed for so long by these same groups of people. Yeah. That's where we're going to see big change, I think. Yep. Yep. All right. Then last one, an encouragement from a woman. She, she titled this email, I am Uncle Joe's wife. And what she meant by that was I wrote a post a couple of weeks ago where I was talking about an analogy of you're at a barbecue at Uncle Joe's house. Yeah. And Uncle Joe is making totally racist, awful, insulting comments. And all of your neighbors and all of their backyards can hear. And all they know about Uncle Joe is that he goes to church and he's a Christian. Right. And how if we confront Uncle Joe publicly so that all of the neighbors hear us confronting him, that actually makes the church look better. Yeah, because then they know not all Christians are like Uncle Joe. Yeah, because by, you know, often we say, oh, we shouldn't have our fights in public. We should take this private. But actually, it's more of a witness mm -hmm. if you confront Uncle Joe publicly. So she said, I am Uncle Joe's wife. Mm -hmm. And she wrote this. I just want to say thank you. I left the mission field with my many children this year. I separated from my husband because of abuse, alcohol use, and his overall misogynistic attitudes towards me. I have tried for years to explain what true intimacy is, but he either never got it or never cared. In search for help, I have read many damaging books, gone to conferences, met with pastors, and I feel like it all empowered my husband to get worse, not better. I started reading your posts and listening to podcasts, and I can't wait to read your book, which I just ordered. Yay! Yay. What you write is so validating. I read your words and feel like Jesus is holding me and bringing such healing just to hear the truth spoken. When you brought up the need to go against the harmful teaching because of the victims, that is me. You are doing it for me and my kids. I can never thank you enough for fully express the life you give back to those who have been so defeated in their marriages and in their churches. I'm sure you will hear more from me in the future. I will be promoting your work as much as I can. I want to go back to school for sex and trauma therapy as well as research, and your team is very inspiring. That's amazing. Yeah, that's yeah. lovely. And, you know, that's what we're here for is just to point people to truth, and mm -hmm. we hope that you do find this validating, and most of all, we hope that you see Jesus. And this is what we mean this. when we're talking about how Jesus left the 99 to go after the one. Yeah. You know, often yeah. when we say things like, I'd rather you keep these conversations in private and this is just uncomfortable or mm -hmm. we don't want to squabble in front of the others you're probably part of the 99 yep yep and you're probably part of the 99 let's not forget the one yeah. and let's make sure that if we do have beliefs that are hurting the one that either we re-examine those beliefs or at least we take special special care yeah to make sure the one isn't getting hurt well it's like i said i want to be part of a church that's that goes after the one not who says well it's just one <laughs>